You may have heard that canned foods are unhealthy and have little to offer nutrition-wise. Fortunately, for those of us who rely on canned foods because they're accessible, affordable, and convenient, this is a myth. Actually, canned foods are similarly nutrient-dense to their fresh counterparts. And eating canned foods even every day is safe from a health perspective. So let's dig into the data. We'll start by comparing the nutrient density of canned foods. And yes, we'll also talk about BPA. To evaluate nutrient density, we're going to use the Nutrivore score. I talked about this calculation in depth in a previous video, but to briefly review, the Nutrivore score is a measurement of total nutrients per calorie. It's calculated as the sum of 33 nutrients relative to their daily values and then divided by the energy density of that food. Quantifying nutrient density is an objective way to understand the quality of the calories in a food. And while it's not the only information we want to be using when choosing foods, it is a great tool for identifying the most nutrient-dense option within highly related foods that could play a similar role in your meal. When we actually crunch the numbers, we see that canning has a minimal impact on nutrient density compared to other cooking techniques across food groups. For example, the Nutrivore score of raw, fresh spinach is 4,548. Boiling spinach doesn't affect its nutrient density very much. It ends up with a Nutrivore score of 4,561. And canned spinach has a Nutrivore score of 4,117, which is still impressively high and only 10% lower than boiled spinach. Let's look at another vegetable. Canned green beans have a Nutrivore score of 588 and an impressive Nutrivore score of 661 if you're also including the liquid, compared to 605 when raw and fresh and 517 when boiled from raw and fresh. And comparing drained canned green beans to boiled fresh green beans, canned are actually 14% more nutrient dense. Part of this difference can be attributed to the nutrients that are lost in the water during boiling. So for example, microwaving fresh green beans to cook them, you end up with a Nutrivore score of 622, a slight increase over raw, which is something that we commonly see in high carotenoid fruits and vegetables, especially fruits and vegetables that are high in lycopene because lycopene tends to increase during cooking. Another similar example is pumpkin, which has a Nutrivore score of 1,036 raw and 1,066 canned. And as an example of a vegetable that doesn't have much lycopene, the Nutrivore score of canned yellow sweet corn is 181, whereas boiled fresh yellow sweet corn, the Nutrivore score is 180. That reminds me of a joke. I didn't have a map to the corn maze, so I had to play it by ear. The sad thing is I got lost. Aw shucks. I hope that mom joke wasn't too corny. <laughs> and I hope it earned your subscribe. Let's look at another food group. Let's look at fish. Canned pink salmon has a Nutrivore score of 752 compared to 625 fresh and raw and 613 when baked from fresh. Now this 23% increase in nutrient density in the canned salmon version can be mainly attributed to the fact that the canning process makes the bones soft and edible. So you're getting a lot of additional nutrition because you can eat those mineral rich bones. When canning larger fish where the, the bones are canned as well, there's not as much of a difference. Light tuna canned in water has a Nutrivore score of 603. The most common type of tuna used for canned light tuna is skipjack tuna, which has a Nutrivore score of 645 raw and 626 when baked from fresh. So the nutrient density of canned tuna is just 4% lower than cooked fresh tuna. Okay, let's look at one last food group. Let's look at a legume. Kidney beans have a Nutrivore score of 413 when raw and dried. Boiled, they have a Nutrivore score of 409. Low sodium canned kidney beans have a Nutrivore score of 398 if you include the liquid and 365 if you drain and rinse them. So 11% lower nutrient density for drained and rinsed canned kidney beans compared to boiled and only 3% lower nutrient density if you're making a recipe that includes the liquid in the can. Some foods are a little more nutrient dense when canned, some foods are a little less, but all in all, the difference in nutrient density is not meaningful. That being said, there are two things to look out for when choosing canned foods. First is a lot of added sodium, and second is added sugars. 
Now, sodium and added sugars aren't bad in themselves and their presence in canned foods does not make that canned food a bad option. Rather, these are nutrients that we want to moderate our intake of in our whole diet. So because we don't want to get too much sodium or too much added sugars, we want to pay attention to how the content of those nutrients in canned foods is contributing to our overall intake. We can also see that adding sugars to canned foods does impact the nutrient density. And that's because when you, for example, can fruit in heavy syrup, you're adding a lot of calories in the syrup to the food, but not adding a ton of nutrition. As an example, peaches canned in light syrup have a Nutrafol score of 81, compared to 295 for fresh peaches and 319 for peaches canned in water. So yes, all in all, canned food options are similarly nutrient dense to fresh. So let's talk about the elephant in the room. What about BPA? Yes, bisphenol A, BPA, does have estrogenic activity, which means it can act like estrogen in our bodies. And toxicology studies show that high exposure to BPA in the range of 1,000 micrograms of BPA per kilogram of our body weight per day can cause reduced gestational and postnatal weight gain, negatively impact the ovary, and negatively impact hormone levels, specifically increasing serum estradiol and prolactin and decreasing progesterone. But here's the thing we need to know. At what level of exposure do we need to start worrying about these effects of BPA? What dose of BPA exposure is safe and what dose isn't? Based on toxicology studies, the US Food and Drug Administration has set a limit of exposure of BPA to 50 micrograms per kilogram body weight per day. And the European Food Safety Authority limit is set to four micrograms per kilogram of body weight per day. However, while controversial still, even among scientists, and causality has yet to be established, there are some newer studies indicating potential harm to our health at much lower levels of exposure to BPA, implying a lowest observable effect level at more like 2.5 micrograms per kilogram per day, which is why the limits that are set by regulatory agencies are currently under review. And the good news is that average human exposure is way less than these levels. A large 2011 nationally based urine biomonitoring study that included broad demographics concluded that the aggregate human exposure to BPA in the United States from all sources was 0.034 micrograms per kilogram body weight per day. That's 117 times lower than the current EFSA limit and 1,470 times lower than the current FDA limit. And that's BPA from all sources. What fraction comes from canned foods? A 2015 study showed that on average, we are exposed to 0.013 micrograms of BPA per kilogram body weight per day from canned foods, most of which came from canned vegetables. But what if you eat a lot of canned foods, like a lot? Well, in that case, you probably still don't need to worry about the BPA. A 2011 study had study participants consume canned foods at each of three meals while blood and urine samples were taken regularly over a 24 hour period. And the study showed a couple of really important things. First is that BPA is quite efficiently eliminated from the human body. The half-life is three to six hours. And second, even eating canned foods at every single meal, the estimated exposure to BPA, the estimated exposure to BPA ended up at 0.27 micrograms of BPA per kilogram body weight per day, which is still 15 times lower than the current EFSA limit and 185 times lower than the FDA limit. Our exposure to BPA from all sources, canned foods, water bottles, thermal receipts, is way lower than the current acceptable daily intake. However, as I mentioned, these limits are currently under review. And if the suggested lowest observable adverse effect level of 2.5 micrograms per kilogram body weight per day is adopted, then whether or not our exposure to BPA remains below the acceptable daily intake level will depend on what safety factor is applied. If a modest safety factor of 10 is applied, our average exposure would still be below that new limit, but consuming canned foods at every meal would be a little bit over that new limit. It's worth noting that while controversial, there are some scientists who are advocating for the limit to be reduced to 0.2 nanograms per kilogram body weight per day, 
This is fairly unlikely since most scientists do not believe that that is where the scientific consensus on this topic is. But if it were to be adopted by regulatory agencies, that would require a complete overhaul of food packaging. Currently, the evidence says we don't need to worry about our current levels of BPA exposure from canned foods. But this is an active field of research and it is possible that large high quality studies could change that conclusion. And if it does, I'll let you know. Manufacturers of canned foods are increasingly opting for BPA alternatives, such as bisphenol S, BPS, and bisphenol F, BPF. While not as extensively studied as BPA, there is evidence that these BPA substitutes are not as toxic at high doses. That being said, all bisphenols can be endocrine disruptors if we're exposed to enough of them. And more research is needed to establish acceptable daily intake levels for BPS and BPF. Overall, the current evidence says we don't need to feel guilty about opting for canned foods. Although given the changing landscape of the scientific evidence, it may be prudent not to eat canned foods at every meal. It's also worth noting that various phytonutrients have been shown to mitigate the effects of BPA, including luteolin, which is found in uh, vegetables of the parsley family, like celery and carrots, as well as peppers, cabbage, broccoli, and apples, naringin, which is found in citrus fruits, quercetin, which is found in onions, apples, green tea, and berries, and N-acetylcysteine, which is found in garlic. That's another pro in the column for eating a wide variety of fruits and vegetables. Yes, even canned ones. And if you like this myth busting, I have an entire chapter addressing food phobic myths in my book, Nutribor, which you can order from any online bookseller or your local independent bookstore.